good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very, very much for uh, attending our book launch today. Uh, such a beautiful book. I had a look at it. Uh, wrote, uh, written by Sophie uh, Richard, who's sitting uh, just here. Published by Japan Society. I um, I had a look at it uh, by myself, and then I found it such a useful uh, information, full of useful information. The title says it all. The Art Lover's Guide to Japanese Museums. And then this covers uh, from traditional art to contemporary art uh, and uh, huge museums to uh, really small museums. I wanted to say thank you for Sophie because I found my alma mater, my university museum here, <laughs> which I, I have been there several times and I don't remember seeing those two items. Mm -hmm. So next time I go back, I really have to visit again and then try to find those. Well, Sophie told me the choice of the museums, I counted, uh, it's about 53, 50, sorry, 55, you told me. Mm -hmm. uh, but altogether, she mentioned about 80 mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. in, in this book. So 55 uh, main museums she uh, listed, but also at the every corner she mentions about the, um, the neighboring sort of area. So this is really, really useful. When you go to Japan, uh, first time definitely, but even the second time, third time, and if you're an art lover, those are the museums you really have to visit. And then, sorry, can I just say the, the price as well? We are selling it downstairs. That's only 17 pounds. Uh, if you're a uh, Japan Society member, it's even cheaper. So after her talk, do go downstairs and get the books. Very, very good book. Beautiful pictures. So I will hand it over to Heidi, who is the director of Japan Society, to introduce you much more in detail. Thank you. Thank you, Shihoko, and thank you, um, Daiwa, for hosting uh, the event this evening. We're very pleased to be here. Um, first came across Sophie about a year and a half ago um, when she actually gave a talk to the Japan Society um, about some of her work on Japanese museums. Um, at that point, uh, we had no intention or no idea that we would jointly publish this book. Uh, but a year and a half later, here we are, and it's been um, a great journey. Sophie is a, a delight to work with. She is one of the most organized and well thought out person people that I've come across so you can be assured that the data in her book will be equally well, well thought out and uh, put together. Um, she's, an, so she's an art historian by background um, having studied at Ecole du Louvre in, in Paris um, which so tells me included some study of Japanese art although that was not um, a major uh, it was just uh, a sort of minor part of the course but her interest and fascination for Japan went way back into her childhood and has been a lifelong passion. And over many years she's visited Japan um, on countless occasions and has grown to love and understand the culture and the art and visited many museums. What for me is very special about this book is the stories of the museums that she gives. These are not just uh, factual go on this day and open, it opens at 9 o'clock and closes at 5 o'clock. It's a story with the, with the curator, with the director. Why is this museum here? What does it do? What's in it? Why is it in it? Um, how does the architecture match up with the contents? Who put, the, put it together? Who designed the labels? It all makes for the part of the story of the museum and is what I think makes this um, a very special book. Uh, you could say I'm biased. Uh, <laughs> Um, it, Sophie will tell you more about how she selected and why she selected some of these um, these museums. It isn't, you know, every museum in Japan. There are over 1,200 art museums, 5,000 museums in general. You would be filling your suitcase several times over with uh, with, a, with volumes to cover all of them. But as an as an insight into a few special museums, this is wonderful. Um, I must also just thank a few other people. Um, the book was supported very generously by um, Mr. Hiraide and the Innovate Japan organisation, and we must thank his, him and his colleagues for their support, and to the Great Britain Sasakawa Foundation, who have also supported the book. 
and I think many of you here gave uh, Sophie your special tips, so thank you to you, you know who you are, and uh, the Japan National Tourist Organization and uh, uh, all the Pon Air White Ways who also supported on this journey to the book. But over to Sophie, mm -hmm. um, who's going to tell you a bit more about some of the, her favorite places in Japan. Thank you. Thank you and good evening all. It's an honor for me to have been invited by the Dawa Foundation to talk to you tonight about my recently published book on art museums in Japan. So thank you very much for hosting the book launch. The Art Lover's Guide to Japanese Museums is the result of almost four years of work and many trips to Japan. I will tell you how the project came about, uh, but first I thought I should mention a few general facts about museums and Japan. There are a lot of museums in the country, as Heidi just said, but this is not a well-known fact um, outside the country. The Ministry of Education and Culture lists 5,600 museums, and this includes uh, science museums, history museums, botanical gardens even. I read somewhere that the country um, has the highest number of museums per capita in the world. It's not possible to check these different countries have a different way of categorizing and counting museums. But let me just tell you that they are all over the country and they can be found in great numbers. There are national museums in Tokyo, Kyoto, Nara, Osaka, and Kyushu, and public museums in every region. Every town is deemed culturally relevant as a municipal museum. And one characteristic of Japan is the high number of private museums. Collectors tend to open their own instead of giving their collections to a national institution uh, like they would do in the West. And companies have their own museums, which give them prestige. Even religious sects have and run museums. Today, I will tell you about art museums specifically, but it's good to know that um, there are all kinds of museums in Japan. Um, some of them can be quite quirky. There is some flexibility with the use of the term museum there, and there is a museum for everything, from bonsai to noodles. Um, and there is also, even in, on the island of Shikoku, a museum that co whose collection is made of uh, copies of the most famous Western paintings and frescoes. Um, so as a result, the museum landscape is very varied. There is something for everybody, but it can also be difficult to navigate it. So this is where I hope the book will come in handy. I started visiting Japan over 10 years ago, and being an art historian, I did what I always do when I travel anywhere in the world. I went to visit museums. For me, they were the first points of entry into the culture, the, the, the thread I followed to try and understand it better. I soon realized that quite a bit of research was necessary in order to find places beyond the most obvious, let's say, the ones that you can find in general guidebooks to the country. Uh, and furthermore, information was not always available in English. Um, I saw many wonderful places, but sometimes I would travel somewhere only to find something that was a little bit disappointing, or find a museum with closed doors. And I will tell you something about that in a minute. In the West, if we read something about museums in Japan, and this is rare, um, this is always through the prism of architecture, because the museum was built recently by a famous Japanese architect, so you can read something about the building, but you never know what's happening inside. So I decided I should do something about it. I wrote a few articles, um, but I felt that there was so much to say and so much more to discover that I decided to write a guidebook. My research took me to more than 100 museums. During my visits, I always interviewed either a curator or the director because I wanted to know the story behind each one of these places. And I selected those that I felt were the most interesting and the most rewarding. The more museum I visit, and for me this is very much an ongoing project, the more I understand about Japan, and I feel that museums are the best gateway to the culture, be it traditional or contemporary. Um, and for me, it's museums. For some people, it's movies or manga. Uh, but for me, it's definitely museums. 
And this is because a visit is usually more than just a way to look at beautiful and stimulating things. You um, it's often learn something about Japanese customs, um, for example, or the great tradition of architecture, the design. Um, and I will show you the first slide. That's my cool. so, that <laughs> um, so you can see here, I hope, uh, a little bit of what I just told you. This is the gallery of Horyuji treasures in the Tokyo National Museum. It was designed uh, by uh, Tanigoshi Yoshio a few years ago. It's the most recent building in the whole complex. And it is a, a beautiful uh, gallery. This is a view of one of the rooms inside. And as you can see, the design is very sleek and precise. Taniguchi is very um, precise in his request and his designs. And uh, the labels on each pedestal has been placed to the side so that it doesn't mar the view. The lighting is also very good. The book, as the title indicates, focuses on art museums. Um, it's been divided into to five broad geographical areas, Tokyo, day trips from Tokyo, Kyoto and its region, the west, and then the east of the country. Most places are easily accessible by public transport, but a few require a bit more dedication, let's say, effort. <laughs> In the book, there are public museums and private museums, historical museums um, and artist houses, large institutions and smaller, more intimate places, um, with collections ranging from traditional Japanese art to cutting-edge contemporary. There is a strong focus on Japanese art, of course, but it's not um, exclusive, and Chinese collections are mentioned, as well as Western art. And I thought I would show you two images. One on the left um, shows you a room with an important collection of Rothko paintings um, in the Kawamura Museum, which is just outside Tokyo. And the Kawamura Museum has a very important collection of post-war American art. And to the right, um, there is a beautiful necklace by René Lalique, the French art nouveau designer. And in Hakone, also not very far from Tokyo, there is the René Lalique Museum. So there are monographic museums dedicated to the work of Western artists in Japan. Tonight I would like to give you uh, an idea of the variety of the places one can visit and some of the major trends animating the museum culture in Japan. I have made a small selection. It was very hard to choose, but I hope it will give you an idea of what you can find in the book. Most trips start in Tokyo, and indeed this is also where the book started. So I just wanted to show you um, an image of this great and fantastic megalopolis. But Tokyo is also this. And um, one day I discovered this house by chance in an area called Daikanyama in central Tokyo which is a very trendy neighborhood with lots of boutiques and low-rise buildings and embassies, for example. So I was just walking around, and um, I saw lots of tall trees behind the building, and I thought, maybe there is a garden, I'll take a break. And what I discovered turned out to be a beautiful traditional house that is open to the public, but very little visited. It was built in 1919, so it's not very old, but it follows traditional uh, design, and it's surrounded by a sizable garden. It was built for Asakura Torajiro, a politician, and inhabited until 1947. So it survived the Great Kanto earthquake of 1923, bombing during the war, before gi being given to Shibuya City, which is a ward within Tokyo, in 1947. As I entered the house to visit it, I was asked to remove my shoes, as would happen in any private house even today, and in, indeed in some museums across Japan. Um, there were no other visitors, and I could walk around in absolute peace in this house that smells of Japanese cedar, uh, hinoki, it's a wonderful warm smell, as well as uh, the fresh grassy smell of tatami, the, um, which covers the floor. Uh, there were uh, I was, as I was there, right in the center of Tokyo, by myself, with all, you know, all these wonderful smells, and still thrilled by having found this house by chance, 
this is when, this was the moment when I decided to write the book about the museum I saw and the ones I hope to discover. The building, as you can see, is very much open to the outside. There is a continuity between the house and the garden. There is a sense of intimacy between the two. Um, and here uh, you see um, a view from the master, um, the bedroom of the master of the house onto the garden with the uh, sliding shutters open. This is a classic element of Japanese design. A garden must be admired from selected point of views um, and there must be a balance between parts that have been tended and others that have been left free. If we continue into the garden, uh, which is by the way quite big for central <coughs> Tokyo, um, we arrive to a tall white building at the back of the garden. Um, it's called the Kura or storehouse, and this is the only construction not to be made of wood. It was used to keep the family's precious belongings. They would be protected, for example, uh, in the event of a fire. And of course, for centuries, when an earthquake occurred, the most damage was not due to the earthquake, but to the fires that would spread from kitchens or factories, for example. So the curator told me that if a fire broke out, people would hang um, wet reeds from the hooks you can see, I hope, on the facade. And uh, they would also seal the windows with a paste that mysteriously included miso paste inside. <laughs> so that's interesting. Uh, here at the Kura Sakura house, the, the Kura is closed, but a number of museums across Japan have used the Kura as an exhibition space quite successfully. And if you are a fan of traditional architecture like I am, I would recommend visiting some of um, Japan's wonderful um, outdoor architectural museums where you can see and enter uh, buildings that have been protected, uh, saved from destruction. The destruction, destruction sorry. In contrast, but still in Tokyo, I would like to show you the Santori Museum of Art. It's located in a recently built development called Tokyo Midtown, which mixes business, retail, apartments, art. Uh, the museum is located in one of its towers, um, and there are other examples of these upstairs museums in Tokyo. The Centauri is a very good example of a private museum of high quality. Uh, it owns a very good collection, the space is very smart, and it organizes well-curated shows. On this point, I would like to take a moment now to mention a fact that has an impact on visits. Museums in Japan tend to rotate their collections a lot. This is due to the nature of the pieces, um, which can be on paper or on silk, so of course they are sensitive to light and they cannot be on display for a long time. Therefore, some famous works of art might not be on view when you visit a museum, and it's good to be prepared for that eventuality. But this rotation also has to do, I believe, with the fact that works of art traditionally were never intended to be on display permanently. They would be shown at a particular time for guests, for a particular event, always in accordance to the season, and then put away again until next time. So, and this fundamental taste for uh, temporary displays has had an impact on the life of the museum, and it has influenced the way things are shown. As a result, between special exhibitions and rotations in display, museum rotates objects very often, and it's important to check their website, I would suggest, in advance to find out about what would be on view, and also check their calendar, as a lot of museums will close for one to two weeks between shows in order to set up for the next one. Western curators are very generous about that. In Japan, they have the opportunity to do it. And personally, I've been in front of closed doors many times, so I've learned my lesson. I always check the calendar before I go. Most museums will organize at least four shows a year, and gen generally, the most important ones are held in the spring or the uh, during the autumn, because traditionally, this is the favorite season for the Japanese to travel within their country because the weather is at its best. So if we go back to the Centauri Museum, and this is a view of uh, the inside. The architect is um, Kuma Kengo, he's one of my fa favorite architects. His designs are always restrained in a way, and he uses indigenous materials such as wood or washi paper, 
which he reinterprets in a very elegant and interesting way. The vertical lines you can see um, on these photos are like his signature. They form a lattice often or screen that can filter the light from the outside. And it gives great importance to the lighting inside and its modulation that's essential to him. And just to go back to the facade, um, the louvers here are made of white porcelain. He designed other <coughs> museums in Japan, some are in the book, but he is also in great demand abroad, and he's been asked to uh, design the new Victoria and Albert Museum in Dundee, Scotland. So Japanese architects are in great demand abroad. I also wanted to show you this view. Uh, this is a view of Tokyo from inside the museum, because I want to illustrate the fact that um, many museums will have a space for you to take a breath, breath relax, um, reflect after having seen an exhibition or in between display galleries. Visiting a museum in Japan is always or often a very comfortable visit. There are fantastic uh, facilities, it's very well organized. Um, there are always free lockers, for example, so it's a detail and it can appear mundane, but it's actually very nice to be able to walk around free without carrying anything. So there is a lot of thought given to that. The, let's go back to the Centauri. The, the museum was established by Centauri, which is a beverage company famous for its whiskey. Um, and actually some of the wood employed in the rooms um, comes from reclaimed whiskey barrels. The company produces beverages, so when the collection was started in 1960, it was decided that uh, the curators would concentrate on objects that are used in the house, and the motto of the museum is the beauty of everyday life. I will show you just a few objects to illustrate this. Um, on the left, you have a writing box in lacquer by uh, Haritsu Ogawa. Um, with the, which is decorated with a specifically Japanese uh, technique called makie, during which you sprinkle silver or gold dust in lacquer while it's still wet. And uh, Ogawa was very um, gifted, and he was able to mimic the texture of all sorts of things. And here, of course, it's shellfish. And for that, he used ceramic and metallic inlays within, in the lacquer. And to the right, there is a beautiful Nabeshima dish. Um, Nabeshima ceramics are <coughs> luxurious types of porcelain that was made from the Nabeshima clan, a, f a family of feudal lords in, on the southern island of Kyushu. This type of dish is were made for the exclusive use of the Nabeshima clan, or uh, they were sent as official gifts to the shogun in Tokyo. They always have this wonderful pictorial quality about them, and here there are stylized pine um, branches and needles that run around the, the rim of the dish, but the center is left free. And um, this is, there is a taste for asymmetry and empty spaces that is typical of Japanese aesthetics. This folding screen as well is a beautiful example of traditional Japanese aesthetics with the pos position of the moon, which is the main subject unexpectedly off-center. Something to keep in mind while we're visiting museums, especially in the West, we always see uh, folding screen flats behind glass, but of course, originally, they were used to separate space within a room. Um, they would usually come in pairs, and they would be placed in a zigzag to stand upright. And that disposition would uh, have an effect on the composition, it would create depth, and perspective, and also with the 17th century, this would be lit by candlelight, so the gold leaf used to um, make the clouds would be shimmering lightly. I would now like to go to Kyoto to tell you about the Laku Museum. It's smaller than the museums I've uh, mentioned before, and it's also more specialized. The Laku Museum is located next to the house and studio of the Raku family which has been making tea bowls specifically for the tea ceremony since the late 16th century. Today, Raku's master is the 15th generation, and he is very involved in the activities of the museum, which is an elegant space dedicated to uh, Raku ceramics. 
And let's remember uh, today's uh, Raku master. His name is Raku Kichizaimon because I will mention him uh, for the next museum. Raku balls are considered by some aficionados the most precious of tea balls. They are made by hand without the use of a wheel and special attention is given to the rim because it will be in contact with the lips. The, the ball you can see on, on the right here with this beautiful pale coral glaze was made in the 17th century by the seventh generation of Raku masters. Sorry, 18th century. How a ball sits in one's hand is very important, but of course this is not something we can feel as we look at objects behind glass in a museum. But because this is something so important and essential to the appreciation of the work, um, the Raku Museum organizes, organizes special days during which people can actually touch and handle the ceramics, sometimes century old. This is quite a special experience and something we do not do in the West. Other museums in the book um, organize for these special days where you can touch the object. Um, there are private museums, of course. It's easier to organize on a smaller scale, but it, it, it's quite special. This leads me to mention that many museums in Japan have a space for the tea ceremony. And there is a natural link between museums and the tea ceremony, the word of tea in general, which has always been accompanied by a thriving culture of creation from ceramics to architecture and from paintings to lacquer, for instance. And tea gatherings also have led to a long-lasting culture of collecting. Museum may simply have a tea room where one can have an abbreviated tea ceremony or enjoy a green tea with a wagashi, a traditional um, cake. Often museum of traditional art will have a room such as this one um, that show a tea room, a life-size tea room, with objects and implements used during the tea ceremony. The objects would be changed according to the season. The world of, of tea is still very much alive today, and there are venues where visitors can admire new, contemporary interpretations of this venerable space. And the tea room I to show you is in the Sagawa Museum just outside Kyoto. It was designed in 2007 by Raku Kichizaimon, the potter I mentioned earlier in Kyoto. He is a fascinating artist. He worked all his life in the Raku tradition, focusing on tea balls only. But um, he is not afraid to collaborate with young uh, conceptual artists in Kyoto, for example, and he even made a foray into architecture. The Sagawa Museum has a collection of 20th century Japanese art, and a few years ago, uh, they approached Raku simply to organize um, a temporary exhibition. But the whole thing turned out to a major architectural project, and um, he designed a permanent new wing for the museum that includes exhibition display galleries and two uh, wonderful tea rooms. They're completely different. I can only show you one tonight, but I, I, this is the uh, largest one. And as you can see, uh, it can, the size can be lifted to let nature come inside the space. And this is a view from the inside. Um, the room was designed to be at the same level as the pond that circles uh, the whole of the museum. This is quite beautiful, as you can see. And when I met Raku-san, I told him so. I said, my god, that was such a beautiful uh, place to be. And he looked at me and said, well, yes, maybe it's beautiful. That was clearly the last thing on his mind. Um, what was essential to him was the feeling this would create. When you go and participate to the tea ceremony, you're kneeling. So you find yourself at the same level as the reeds in the pond. And this is what he wanted us to feel. Um, he wanted us to feel like the plants, symbolically, but also physically. This has to do with humidity, with it, which is an essential notion of the word, in the world of tea, and also the closeness and the importance, the importance of nature. Next in this presentation, I would like you to take you to Eastern Japan to show you a prefectural museum, in other words, a regional museum. From the 1980s onwards, every county decided it wanted its own museum. 
and places often of palatial um, proportions were commissioned to architects. Usually, because they were founded in recent decades, they focus on modern and contemporary art, and they also have a strong link to their locality. One of these prefectural museums is the Aomori Museum of Art in northern Honshu, about four hours north of Tokyo. It was opened in 2006 and designed by the architect Aoki Jun, who signed here his first museum. He created a white modernist-like st structure that emerges beautifully from the snow. Of course, we're in northern Japan, so there are heavy snowfalls in season. Aoki was inspired by the climate, but also by the location. The museum stands next to an important archaeological site from the Jomon period, which is Japan's first culture during the Neolithic era. <coughs> uh, it's called the Sanai Maruyama ruins. The architect's design is in resonance with the excavation site next door. He dug deep into the ground, um, and in his plan, he echoed the maze-like trenches nearby, and he made use of an earth-based material, dark brown in color, and it uh, alternates it with white, either on the floor or on the walls. And this um, juxtaposition of white and dark brown forms a very dynamic space, which is a refreshing change from the often, you know, the, the usual white cubes that we see in new museums. The galleries are hidden below floor level for most of them, but they are tall, light, and unexpectedly spacious. Massive wall seems to be hovering above the floor. I don't know if you can quite see, but behind the lady who is playing the violin here, the wall does not touch the floor. It, there, is, there is a gap between the wall and the floor, and it, it happens all around the museum. All the galleries are different. Um, and the photo gives you a sense of scale because we're, we're underground here. Um, like any other muse or recent museum um, in Japan, there was a desire to create a strong visual identity. So a designer has been employed to create a logo, um, also the signage throughout the museum, and he even created uniforms for all the employees that are white, so very modern looking. As all regional institutions, the Aomori Museum focuses on artists from its area. Among them is Nara Yoshitomo, who was born in Aomori in 1959 and who is now internationally renowned. The museum owns a very large group uh, of works by him. The most fa famous and perhaps the most beloved one is um, this dog, Aomori Ken. It's Nara's largest work to date. It's uh, eight and a half meters high. And it stands in an open gallery, open air gallery. The dog's cartoonish features are characteristic of Nara's work, which explores the world of childhood. And indeed, when you stand next to the door, you're reminded how everything can appear gigantic when you're a child. The dog has become um, the museum's mascot, and in the winter they give him cute little wooden hats, and in the summer he has a, um, a little bowl of water. <laughs> From the museum, visitors can walk to the archaeological site, and this proximity is significant. Originally, the museum was supposed to be part of a huge cultural complex that was clearly designed to be next to the archaeological site. In the end, the town didn't have the money to do the whole complex, but the museum opened. And there is a wish to integrate ancient heritage with contemporary culture. In a way, the museum here is saying that art made today in Aomori has its roots in Jomon culture. Many museums around the country have clearly been founded to revitalize an area, as well as help raising the profile of a region or a town. A number of them have done so successfully, and you can find others in the book. For the next and last group of museums, we are going to leave Honshu, Japan's main island, to go to the inland sea, um, to a group of islands. For this, one has to travel west. It takes about five hours from Tokyo, first on the bullet train, then on the commuter train, then on the slow boat. Um, the pace definitely slows down, and you have to leave Tokyo behind. 
It's interesting to note that things have not been changed particularly to fit tourist needs. And you can experience island life, which has not been changed by consumerism. And then you would arrive on the island of Naoshima to start visiting the Benese art site, which is one of the most exciting places in the world today to see contemporary art. It was started about 20 years ago with one museum on the island of Naoshima, which you can see here, it was designed by Tara Wendo. Uh, and it now has it's spread now on two further islands with various museums, buildings, uh, site specific commissions, which involve artists from around the world. A Benice Art Site is the collective term for this private project, which was founded by one individual called Fukutake-san, whose family made a fortune in uh, publishing. And he, he, want, he comes from not very far, and he wants to help these islands. The museum on each of these three islands have a different character and illustrate various notions and concerns that are important for the founder and also the artists that are involved in the project. I can't show you everything, of course, but I selected two places. One is on the island of Teshima, and it's called the Teshima Art Museum. This is what we selected for the cover of the book. The building was designed by Nishizawa Ryue, uh, who is one of the two partners in Sana, an architectural practice um, that has done other museums, and, and they're very uh, renowned. They, they got the Pritzker Prize of Architecture a few years ago. His buildings often have these soft, organic forms. Here it's in the shape of a drop of water. At the moment, um, it touches the ground. This is a large, single room with no columns or separating walls, and it's open to the elements. Inside, there is an installation by Naito Rei on the theme of water, and both the architect and the artist collaborated together quite closely to create um, this museum. There is water trickling continuously inside, so you hear that, but you also hear the wind, you hear birds, you hear the rain, it rains. So nature is an essential element of uh, the museum, and it's a very, it has a very active part in it. And as you can see, it blends beautifully with its um, surrounding, surroundings. So it sits uh, amongst rice paddies that um, were also um, launched by the Benice Art Foundation at the same time as uh, the, when the museum was being built. Um, and the foundation wanted to um, help regenerate the island. So with the help of the residents, they uh, started planting rice on land that had been left abandoned. And again, the participation of the residents is, shows here on this project, but it, uh, throughout uh, the islands, they, they're there uh, working with the artists. It's, very, it's an essential part of, uh, of the whole project. To finish, I would like to show you something a little bit special. At the end of each entry in the book, there is a section that gives recommendations for places to visit or things to do near each museum that has been described. It can be another museum, uh, a neighborhood to explore, some a restaurant, or even um, a place where to enjoy one of Japan's fam famous hot springs. There is always a link with the museum described, but it can take many forms. So I would like to show you um, a public bathhouse, or sento, which was designed by the artist Otake Shinro. It was commissioned by Benese Art Site on Naoshima, the first island to receive museums. Um, and this is also where visitors can stay overnight. And if you go, I would recommend at least staying two nights, because there is a lot to see. So this bathhouse has a very unconventional design. Otake put together objects he collected and also things that were given to him by the residents of the islands. But while the design is unusual, having a public bath on the island is not. Once public bathhouses were all over Japan, uh, and it was a place where people would socialize. And this is something you can do too as a visitor. Uh, this is an artwork you can enter and experience in the nude. Men and women are each have their own room. Um, and you can mingle with the locals who, of course, use it as well it is, their public bath. 
So on these islands, there is a respect for traditional Japanese culture and a desire to emulate it. An effort to restore part of the landscape with the rice paddies, for example, um, a wish to sustain the local economy and support these islands that were really facing depopulation until recently. But there, it, this is also completely open to the rest of the world, and the islands welcome international artists and um, international visitors in great numbers now. So as a way to conclude with the last slide, I wanted to say that going to a museum is an experience that can take many forms, of course. When it is good, it does take you somewhere else, intellectually or in time, and I feel this is particularly true in Japan. This evening I have shown you museums in city centers, others in the countryside, in a remarkable setting. Uh, some were small, others were large uh, institutions. But a visit to any of these places can tell you much more than the history of art. Museums say some things about Japan's enduring tradition, its sense of design, its amazing architecture, its wealth also. A lot of the museums I showed you tonight are privately run. And um, also visiting them uh, is a way to discover great beauty and nature, which is not something necessarily one um, associates with Japan when we think about its uh, sprawling urban centers. So there are many other places I, will, I would have liked to show you tonight and tell you about, but space does not allow us to do so. But I hope this taster will, want to, uh, will make you want to go and explore further. Thank you very much. <laughs>